one. Welcome to Teaching Skills for Technical Experts. My name is Tori Brennison. What we're going to do today, we're going to have a little talk about some educational philosophy. I'm going to tell you two things you need to know to be really popular at parties. I'm going to talk a little bit about curriculum and how to develop it. We're going to talk about student assessment. We're going to talk about audience management. A little bit about me. Like I said, my name is Tori. I'm an integration specialist at OnShift in Cleveland, Ohio. I am also a legitimate art historian. I have an MA in the history of art from University College London. One person clapped, and I am super impressed with that. <laughs> Thank you. That, that made all that, all that study worth it. <laughs> now, I am a giant education nerd, OK? Master's degree in art history, you kind of have to be. I love the idea of conferences. I love being in technology and having this career now because the very the people coming together, sharing their knowledge, learning from their peers, that's amazing. I love conferences. One of the conferences that I love the most is CodeMash. Who went to CodeMash this year? Woo. Yeah. Okay, some hands in the audience. If you're not familiar with CodeMash, um, the first two days of the conference, it's a four-day conference. Um, they're called Precompiler. They're workshops, basically. And I don't do precompiler because that's too much code mash for me. But my friends do precompiler, and I have like really severe FOMO, okay, like the fear of missing out. So I'm in the group chat, like, well, I'm not at code mash, and they are, and I'm like, what's going on? Like every 30 seconds, I'm terrible. So what happens is my friends are at code mash, they're doing the precompilers, and one of my friends comes in the group chat, and she says, man, I'm in this session, and this guy, he's just he's going through things so quickly, and this is supposed to be introductory, but he's dropping so many buzzwords that I'm just, I'm writing them down to look up later, because I can't follow along. And another one of my friends comes in, and he says, you know, I can empathize with that. I'm in a session right now, and it's, it's for a language that I use every day, and I'm familiar with these concepts, but the speaker's not putting them together in a way that's really coherent. It's like, he tried to do a follow along and a lecture, but he didn't really commit to either one of those, and I'm just, I'm confused. And so, me being an education nerd, I said, maybe I should come in, and, you know, next year I'll do something and I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it about, you know, teaching people how to teach. And I said, yeah, Tor, you should do that. So, it's now four months later and I'm at Stir Trek doing exactly that. I want to define two things here real quick. I'm going to use the word student and teacher over and over again in this talk. And, you know, I'm going to use the words like lesson and classroom, student, teacher, things like that. And you're probably not going to be up in front of a traditional classroom. You might be one-on-one -on -one with someone at work. You might be meeting with your team at work. You might be speaking to a conference like I am. For the sake of simplicity for this talk, the teacher is going to be the one who has knowledge or experience and is trying to impart it to someone else. The student is going to be the person trying to attain that knowledge or experience guided by the teacher. Now that we have that cleared up, I'm going to teach you how to be fun at parties with this guy named Bloom and this guy named Gardner. Okay, you can go to the next party, go look really aloof and interesting in the corner, and when people come up to you, be like, let me tell you about education. It's a hit every time. Bloom's taxonomy. Taxonomy is a classification scheme. Okay, if you have a computer science degree, you may have heard of Flynn's taxonomy or Fenn's classification. Same kind of idea here. So Bloom, this is a classification, okay, of understanding and knowledge application. Bloom's taxonomy is based on cognitive load or the mental effort and the type of knowledge involved in performing a task. A higher order task requires more abstract thought. A lower order task requires more specificity. The higher you go in the taxonomy, the more responsible you are for puzzling things out. Looks like this. At the bottom of the pyramid, we have recall, basic remembering, followed by understanding, application, analysis, evaluation, and creation. Now, it's not a complete strict hierarchy, especially as you get closer to the top. Okay, it requires less mental effort to recall a fact that's remembering on the bottom of the pyramid, than it does to apply that fact to a situation and act accordingly. But once you get into things like analysis, evaluation, and creation, the effort involved gets a little bit iffy. And to illustrate what I mean, 
Who here knows what a haiku is? Raise your hand if you know what a haiku is. Okay. You in the front. How many syllables are in the first line of a haiku? Five. Exactly. The answer I was looking for. That question had a very definite answer. And you need to know that a haiku has five syllables in the first line in order to prove that you know what a haiku is. It's harder, though, to write a haiku. You have to think more. Now, this, is, this is my haiku, and I don't think it's a very good haiku, but I wanted to prove to you that I know what I'm talking about. But it's even harder, OK, if I ask you to tell me the similarities between a haiku and a sonnet. You have to know what a haiku is. You have to know what a sonnet is. And you have to put in the mental effort to know how they're similar and how they're different and put that into words. Analysis, in this case, is probably more difficult than creation, even though creation is at the top of the hierarchy. What I want you to take away from this is that there's levels of understanding and application involved in learning. And especially when we get to the assessment portion of this talk, we're going to talk about Bloom a little bit more. Other thing we're going to talk about would be fun at parties. This guy, Howard Gardner, came up with his theory of multiple intelligences. And when we think about intelligence, generally we think about things like IQ tests, which measure capacity for abstract thought, okay, those higher order tasks up on Blooms. But Gardner here held that there's not one universal type of intelligence. Instead, each individual has multiple types of intelligence. So I don't just have one of these things. I don't have, for example, visual spatial intelligence only. I have all of these, but maybe I prefer two or three of them. And these aren't learning styles. Gardner detests the phrase learning styles. He'll say that this is about cognitive capability and application, not about style. And it's mostly used by educators, um, psychology, not so much Gardner. There's no real empirical basis for this. It's a theory about how we think rather than something that measures ability. His theory has also been criticized for being very broad. In psychology, if you're interested in intelligence theory, if you look at Charles Spearman and two-factor often, two-factor intelligence, not two-factor authentication, those are two different things. <laughs> this is a tech conference. But two-factor intelligence, it's more accepted in the realm of psychology. But we keep up with Gardner in education because it tends to work. So I'm guessing we have a lot of computer scientists here. So there's probably a very high logical mathematical intelligence in this room. People with that type of intelligence who prefer it, they tend to be very conceptual thinkers. They have good pattern recognition, very reasonable. They're into logical problem solving. People, on the other hand, who have a very high body kinesthetic intelligence, they learn by doing. They're very coordinated. They like to move a lot. That's not me. I'm not very graceful. You have a high visual spatial intelligence. You tend to be good at visualizing things and manipulating objects in 3D space. If you have a good verbal linguistic intelligence, you tend to be good with words. I mean, I'm sure you get where I'm going, right? Can we, can we nod if you get where I'm going and can move on? Okay. You need to be wary, though, of thinking that there's a best way to learn based on your intelligence that you prefer. Now, the reason that educators still apply Gardner to their teaching practices is because it tends to work, like I said. Teaching something in a few different ways makes information more likely to stick. If you develop your lessons to appeal to at least two types of the multiple intelligences, it's more likely to be applied and remembered. And this is something the pluralizing of teaching methods is something that Gardner himself recommended. So now that we're good at parties, we're going to move on to lesson planning. And to be honest, lesson planning is my least favorite part of teaching. Curriculum and development is kind of painful, but you need to suffer through it anyway. Most likely, you won't be in a traditional classroom. You'll be up here like me or one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. And curriculum development is the phrase I'm going to use anyway for making your teaching plan. What I mean by curriculum in this case is your teaching plan. And you need to plan ahead. And you might say, Tori, I'm only going to sit down with a new employee for maybe two hours tops and teach them about our QA process. Do I really need a teaching plan? Yes, thank you. Do my, come up here, give my talk for me. Um, yes, you need a teaching plan. You need to plan ahead even if you were only teaching one person. The way I go about this, I make my teaching plan based on two things. What I want the student to learn 
and how I am going to teach it, how I want them to absorb that information. There are two magical questions that I want my student to be able to answer at the end of instruction. They are why and what is, sometimes also how. So you're teaching programming and you're teaching arrays. In my experience, teaching people who are new to programming, arrays are very difficult to grasp. At the end of the lesson, I want my student to be able to tell me what an array is, why it is useful, and what it is used for. Something I also need to think about is how I'm going to tell when they've learned what I'm teaching. And when we get to assessment, we'll talk more about that. When you start off, you want to make a learning objective. Your learning objective is, at the end, what you want that student to, to know at the end. But it cannot be too broad. I hear all the time that people come and they're like, Tori, I'm going to teach people how to, how to program. And I'm like, that's fantastic, but that is not a learning objective. That is entirely too broad. You don't go one lesson and learn how to program. It's not a one and done kind of thing. You can't just, I'm going to learn how to program. I'm going to teach people how to program, and that's it. End of story. We're done. That's all your lesson plan is. You can't even narrow it down and be like, oh, well, I'm going to teach them Java. Maybe you take someone who already has some programming background and teach them Java syntax. Your learning objective is your sprint goal. It's not an epic, it's your sprint goal. The tasks, okay, your lessons, those sprint tasks are lessons that your student needs to learn in order to fulfill the goal. When you're, when you're planning, okay, you need to come up with some real world examples, if at all possible. And these don't need to be real, they can be like a silly little simile or a joke, just something that gives students the ability to visualize something. Going back to Gardner, if we can appeal to visual spatial intelligence and let students mentally see concepts, as well as just read about them or have them explained, more chance of success. If you can meet your students ahead of time and see kind of where they're at and kind of what they don't know already, that's a plus fantastic, but you should also take care to avoid jargon and magical hand waving. There is no, oh, well, it just works that way. We don't, we don't do, oh, it just works that way, that's just the way we do it. You need to prepare explanations for basic concepts if you think your students may be missing them going into the lesson. If you try to build a balcony on a one floor ground level building, you end up with a patio. And when you're trying to build a balcony, you don't want a patio. Now, so I'm going to talk about information chunking real quick. Use in tight. <laughs> chunking. Funny name, but comes from cognitive psychology. It's a process where the brain stores information in themed small chunks to make it easier to recall. And this is a natural process. We do this naturally. But if you can help your students along by kind of pre-chunking that information, more power to you. It's kind of like the way that we think of phone numbers. You don't just give a 10-digit you know, string of numbers. You give the area code, the prefix, and the number. I'm gonna call attention to attention span, too. The average adult attention span, like focused sustained attention, is 10 to 20 minutes. For kids, it's even less. You can never count on having someone's full attention span. I want you to plan a change of pace roughly every 10 minutes, because otherwise you'll just, people will zonk out. And I know I'm speaking at 3.30 right now, and I'm watching you guys, and I know you're zonking out. So once you determine what you're going to teach, how do you present that information? You want to relate your small lessons back to your big learning objective. You want to appeal to multiple intelligences. And you want to make sure that just because the student is kind of following along and now they know how to use something, you want to make sure they understand it. Part of one of my jobs was to teach teenagers how to code. And the amount of kids who would pick up on something and use it all over their projects and not be able to explain it back to me was astounding. You have to get in the habit of being like, are you sure you understand this? Explain it back to me as you're using it. And I know I keep saying the magical word assessment. I promise we're getting there. But you need to have a plan to tell how the student is learning the material. You need some way of making sure that what you're doing is effective. To go back to our arrays, I can read all of these bullet points on the left over and over. I can tell people that an array is a data structure, it's a collection of things, you know, there's this thing, it's an index, it's a unique identifier, you can access the things in the arrays individually. 
I can say this to adult learners until I am blue in the face and they will stare at me and be like, I don't get it. As soon as they see this picture, everything comes to you and they're like, oh yeah. This is my real world example. This is, I have you know, people who have very good linguistic intelligence and they prefer reading things and you know, this bullet list is fine. But people who are more of that visual spatial intelligence, they need that picture. I'm also gonna give you guys an actual teaching method to take home with you. I'm a Cub Scout leader and scouting uses the heck out of the edge method. It's extremely effective for task-based learning, which when we're in tech and you're teaching people things like how to program, very useful. The first step in the method is to explain. Explain what you'll be teaching, use visual aids if possible, and kind of gauge where your students are in their understanding while you're doing your explanation. After you've gone through your explanation, do it again while demonstrating the task. Use actual materials, so you know, open up an editor and show them how you code while you're explaining what you're doing. Then, have the students practice the task while you observe and coach them, guide them through it. So they're doing, but now you're kind of holding their hand and kind of coaching them along. Finally, you enable them by letting them go. Okay, baby birds have to learn how to fly. Let the students practice that task on their own without your intervention. And in some cases, that can be the scariest part because you never know what's gonna go wrong. So going back to our arrays, so again, when I was teaching kids, we'd have a lecture, we'd have a PowerPoint, we'd go through that. Then one of us would open up an editor and we would do a live coding. We would create something while they watched. They would then have a practice tutorial on their own and we'd go around the room and they'd raise their hand if they had questions and we'd come and help them through it. And finally, we'd assign a project where the easiest way to get to the solution was to implement what we just talked about. Like I said, when you're teaching tech, the edge method works extremely well. It's very effective. So we're gonna go ahead, we're finally gonna talk about assessment. And with assessment, we're evaluating that what we've taught has been successfully absorbed. We have evaluated that the student is getting what we're talking about. It's not just tests. When we think of assessment, we tend to think of things like our, you know, our, our final exams in college or big exams at the end of high school, and, and that's not what we're about here. That's not going to help us. If your job is giving you a final exam, like I don't know where you work and I don't wanna know where you work. <laughs> that's terrifying. There are three types of assessment. There's a pre-assessment, which happens before you even start teaching. And there's summative, summative assessment, which happens after you've finished teaching. But what I wanna focus on right now in this talk is formative assessment. It's likely going to be the most useful to you with what you're doing. Now, formative assessment checks for student understanding unless you adjust immediately based on the student's feedback. You can review a topic or approach a lesson differently if something isn't working kind of in the moment instead of waiting until the end and suddenly everything is terrible and now you have to fix it and review and everything's awful and everyone's frustrated. No one likes that. It's not a good time. So we talked about our learning objective being the sprint goal and our lessons being sprint tasks. Formative assessment, it's your stand-up. It's your daily check-in. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be painful. Your student doesn't even need to know you're doing it. You can be tricky about it. quick and easy kind of assessments. Open-ended strategic questioning, okay? Think of pairing with someone more junior to you. You're there and they're working through, they're, they're fixing a bug, okay? There's a bug in the code and they're, they're kind of working through it. You wanna ask, why is it broken? What's happening that causes it to fail? Have them explain that back to you to see how well they understand. While they're working on the fix, same thing. Why are we fixing it this way? What solution are we implementing? Everyone's heard of rubber duck debugging, right? You, you have your duck and you explain the problem to your duck. You are their duck. 
All you need to do is sit down and shut up. It's dead easy. And finally, when you do have to coach them through something at the end, just on a scale of one to five, how well do you understand what we just did? If they give you a five, trust their judgment, be like, okay, off you go. If they give you a one or a two, roll back all your changes and do it again. It's not gonna hurt anything. And I really, really want, I had to cut part of this talk because we don't have Wi-Fi, and I really, really wanted you to play Kahoot. Has anyone ever heard of Kahoot? No, a few people have heard of Kahoot. Isn't Kahoot a great time? Yeah, Kahoot's a great time. We, teenagers love Kahoots. I've had grown adults, I've had a classroom full of adults play Kahoot and get like really competitive and yelling at each other. It's fantastic. You get this lovely dashboard, you make like a little quiz, and then students call in on like their mobile phone or their workstation, they put in the pin, and everyone plays against each other. It's got a theme song that is worse than Jeopardy and it repeats on loop for the entire time. It's great. <laughs> so I have three suggestions. There's Kahoot, there's Poll Everywhere, which allows for real-time feedback. Um, things like conferences, because you can get from a large pool of people. That's great. Um, Socrative is similar to Kahoot, but it's not as competitive, and it doesn't have a catchy theme song, so I would go with Kahoot, personally. And all of those are quick, they're relatively easy, and they're free, mostly. Um, I believe things pull everyone to creative. I think if you have a very large group of people, there's a paid plan for it. So finally, we're gonna talk about talking. We're gonna talk about talking and communication, whether you're speaking to a large group or whether you're one-on-one -on -one with your mentoring. You wanna think things through ahead of time. Think about things like your group dynamic. How many people are you teaching to? Teaching to one to five students is different than, I have a lecture hall of, of all of you in front of me right now. It's a very different situation. Are they strangers? Are they people that you know? Are they your teammates? What kind of experience do they have? Think those through first. Think about your environment. Right now we're in a movie theater. We have no Wi-Fi. But I do have a projector. I have a clicker. I have a camera. What are you gonna have available? You think about environmental factors. If it was too warm in here, if it was too cold, you guys might be uncomfortable, you're not gonna focus well. You wanna avoid the after lunch food coma. Who had an after lunch food coma today? Everyone, <laughs> everyone has the after lunch food coma. Like I said, I'm also well aware I am in the last time slot. So I, I know that you guys, are, you guys are checked out for the day. That's okay, I'm trying to be as entertaining as I can and you've laughed a couple times, so thank, thank you, thank you for that. Remember the adult attention span. You're never, almost never, you know, never gonna get a full 20 minutes of attention span. Generally 10 minutes, all you're gonna get. And if you have young adults or kids, even less. Another lesson from Cub Scouts, okay. The end of every single Cub Scout leader training video, they give you this acronym, this Kismet, which stands for keep it simple, make it fun. And so yeah, keeping it simple, making it fun, that sounds great, right? So we're gonna make things really fun because everyone likes fun. The problem is that when your visual aid is a PowerPoint presentation, how do you make it fun, right? Who loves making PowerPoints? Everyone, okay? But if you try and make your PowerPoint too fun, okay, there's a danger in that because you go to PowerPoint hell. <laughs> Low resolution images, weird font choices, poor color contrast, teeny tiny fonts, too many bullet points, so many bullet points, all of the bullet points. You know that people read silently to themselves about 10 to 20 times faster than you can read aloud to them? If you drown people in bullet points, they are never gonna pay attention to you ever again. Needless animations, slide transitions, I hate slide transitions. Bad, meaningless clip art. Word art is still a thing in 2019, which blows my mind. Okay. The first part of keep it simple, make it fun, is keep it simple. My rule for PowerPoints is that if your PowerPoint looks like a teenage girl's GeoCity page circa 2002, <laughs> you are doing it wrong. Okay, I want everyone to just write that down. GeoCity circa 2002, you are doing it wrong. Move on to how to read a room. So I'm really happy that I just made you guys laugh because now you're paying attention to me again. 
you know, when we first came in here and we set up the talk, I asked you to get your notes out, focus, we'll start when all eyes are on me. That's something in the teaching world that we, have, we call first step compliance. And it's a really simple command. Eyes on me, look at the screen, just something to establish the start of your lesson by giving everyone a really easy task to accomplish. It's really easy to just focus on something. And that signifies that you're starting something special. Now I just paused for emphasis there. And you need to do some strategic pausing. But not just for emphasis. Every so often, just work it in there, take a pause, and listen to the environment. If you just made a major point in your presentation and there's furious typing, people are probably taking notes, okay? But if you pause and you have not just made a major point in your presentation and you hear furious typing, those people are answering their emails. They're not paying any attention to you at all. Things like that you want to pay attention to, tiny things. Reading a room is like reading body language, except on an extremely large scale. You want to try and make eye contact with people in the front. Try and make contact with people in the back, although you know there's a really bright projector right there, so I'm sorry, everyone. I, I can't look at the back, really. But the middle of the room is where you want to focus a lot of your attention. And that's because the people up front will naturally be more engaged with you because they're in close proximity. All the way in the back, you people will naturally be less engaged with me because you're so far away. But if you have the attention of the middle of the room, you're probably being successful in keeping that attention. So pay attention to the middle, and they'll pay attention to you. You also want to watch for kind of fleeting micro-expressions on people's faces. If you're going to make a major point in your presentation, look at someone in the audience and see how they react. Teeny tiny frowns, twitches, you know, smiles, things like that, and they let you kind of get a handle on how people are receiving what you say. And if audience is kind of absolutely wavering and you're losing everyone, this is my favorite trick. My favorite trick is to move around. Now I have a box on the floor right here, and I can, I can go about here, and, and I can go here, and if I, if I do that, then I'm, I'm off the camera. But my favorite trick is to just wander out into the audience, because it freaks people right the heck out. <laughs> they don't know what you're doing if you're wandering around like in the audience. They're just like, what is, whoa, she's here. <laughs> it's great, they have, they have no choice but to actually give you attention. Moving it can be very strategic. You also notice I keep having you guys raise your hands. And I mean, this, this, he's probably afraid I'm gonna call him again if he raises his hand. But don't, there's no more hand raising direct questions in this presentation. Just anything you can do to kind of get that little, that little interaction. You do it every so often. I was saying you wanna to react to the mood of the room, but you don't want to be reactive. If you feel that the mood of the room is becoming negative, okay, there's, don't be a downer. Don't just accept it and be like, oh yeah, I know everyone's miserable. How oh, we'll get through it. Like, no one wants that. Acknowledge the mood, maybe make a joke about it, search for any sort of positive engagement you can get and focus on that. But don't be a don't be a downer. I know that sometimes we have to make presentations and things where we give bad news, but don't play into it as much as possible. And oddly enough, doing this one-on-one -on -one is a little bit like doing it to a large room on a very, very small scale. Really, the only thing that's different that I have in the slide is active listening. When you're practicing active listening, you're actually listening to the other person and not just waiting to respond. You don't need to fill every single silence, okay? You don't need to, you know, talk over the student. You listen until they finish what they've said and you repeat it back to them to make sure you've understood. And when I say don't talk over your student, I mean don't talk over your student. You don't interrupt them. Okay, no one likes that. It's rude. Don't do it. And while you're doing this, you need to watch your student for signs that they are becoming bored, frustrated, or threatened by the conversation. Okay, things like leaning, leaning away, or looking away, or crossing their arms and legs, or hunching over. Like, this is very closed off. So what you need to do is lean in, make eye contact, and don't close yourself off. Keep your body language very open. Appear as non-threatening as possible. I mean, I realize that I sound like a nature documentary right now, but 
Okay, learning new things can be scary and we don't want to scare people. That's what I'm getting at. It also helps that if you and your student come together at a table, you always sit next to them, okay? You make a pair, you never sit across from them. It can be also very, very threatening. And speaking of threatening, again, don't be reactive. If something isn't going well, if both of you are getting frustrated, it is absolutely fine to take a break and cool off before you come back. You're not gonna lose anything by taking a break. Okay, you lose your patience, it's all over. Finally, when you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, even in small groups though too, acknowledge improvements. Even small improvements, especially small improvements. Everyone likes a compliment, and it will build a great relationship to acknowledge that your student is working hard, and even if they have like a just teeny tiny amount of excesses, great job, you did really well with that. Everyone likes that. And I shouldn't have to say this. I absolutely should not have to say this, and I hate that I have to say it. Students are people too, okay? They are not an empty vessel for you to pour knowledge into and then they can regurgitate it back out. You're dealing with a real live person. Everyone has bad days. Everyone gets frustrated. There are times when you know, they just can't focus. Someone in this room is probably having a really bad day right now, okay? Empathy is extremely important. If you're the teacher, you are also the leader you're the one in charge, and your attitude is what sets the tone, okay? You're responsible for a positive environment. There are three behavioral rules that you absolutely need to follow when you're going to teach. You need to be patient, because students will know when you're frustrated, okay? And they will feel like you are frustrated with them, and like they are failing you, and that is not what you want. That is the last thing you want. Okay, you need to take a break if you're losing your patience. And you know what, if you need to make up an excuse to take a break, you make up an excuse. And I suddenly, I'm very thirsty, I need to go to the water fountain, I need to go to the bathroom, I'm starving and we need to eat lunch, just anything, take a break. You need to stay positive. Your teaching enthusiasm is job number one. You need to rephrase your frustrations as challenges to you. They are not your students' challenges, okay? Technology involves so much problem solving. That's all we do all day. And that requires persistence and a positive attitude because otherwise this great tech adventure that you're having turns into a grind that no one wants to do. And finally, there's no passing the buck. There's absolutely no buck passing. If you don't know something, you admit it and you find out with your student. Okay, you're teaching them to research solutions. It's an extremely important skill for the industry we're in. Okay, you're, you're not God, you're not infallible, you need to own up to that and teach your student how to work through it with you. No one's, no one's the best, you don't know everything. So I just wanna end by saying, little disclaimer, this presentation is a toolbox. It has tools in them, in it. I hope you use them, but I'm not a licensed education professional. I have some experience, but no teaching certificate. I'm not your boss, I can't tell you what to do. I'm not your mom, can't tell you what to do. I'm a chick in a jean jacket from a family full of teachers who occasionally teaches teenagers how to code, and I love sharing cool stuff with people. That's all I am. Um, there's some resources. Um, you'll be able to find these slides on GitHub, so I'm not gonna spend too long on the slide, but once again, I'm Tori Brennison. Integration Specialist OnShift. Now thank you for coming. I want to thank you for coming to Star Trek. And I'm I'm gonna end. Let's go see Endgame, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Did we have any questions? Okay. Yeah, we'll answer some questions. So the question was, what are some strategies, okay, for dealing with those short attention spans? And uh, it may have already been covered, but they had a short attention span. <laughs> so like I said, if you can move around, moving gets attention every single time. And not just me waving my click around up here, move into the audience, like do something unexpected. Um, if all else, you know, like break and play a game, have a kahoot up your sleeve or something. 
you know, it's, it's great if you have something just unexpected that you can pull out or even, you know, off the wall just, hey, you, I have a question for you. Can you answer this? Just something that grabs that attention right back. One more? Uh, another question. Any comments, I hope I'm saying this right, any comments on anthragogy versus pedagogy? Any comments on was it, pedagogy versus andragogy? No, I have no comments. I have about 70% of a teaching certificate, but that was also got like 10 years ago before I became an art historian. So I'm gonna have to like Google that. I'll Google that and get back to you in the Slack. How about that, whoever asked? Because I don't know, I'm not infallible. One more? Would you modify your approach when you're doing more of a corrective teaching? Would I modify my approach doing more of a corrective teaching? Only slightly, if I'm going to be corrective, I need to be very kind about it and we need to keep communication as open as possible. So be like, say I have, there's another employee that I've coached through something and they've made a mess. Approach it kindly and be like, what, did I fail you in instructing the first time? Is there anything that I can do to help you fix this? Because it needs to be fixed. We're going to go on this together. We're gonna to figure out what went wrong. This is a learning experience for both of us. And we're gonna move forward. We don't wanna blame. No one likes blame, shame stays with you for a really long time, we want to avoid that as much as possible. Because trust me, if they've messed up, they already feel bad enough. All right. Is that it? All right, well, thank you guys for coming again.